Hi everyone, thanks for joining us uh, today. Uh, my name is Will Marie, and Red City is very proud to be hosting uh, this webinar today. I just want to give a little bit of uh, uh, information on Red City in case you haven't come across us before I hand over to Olivia, Walter Executive Director at Wildlife Vets International to introduce our speaker today, Nick Masters. So Red City is a vet specialist support service and we uh, provide support globally 24 seven um, to the veteran teams in regards to providing teleradiology, remote reading on X-ray, CT and MRI cases, and that covers all species, as well as providing um, a support on case manager management through our multidisciplinary team um, through teleconsulting. We are also supporting universities and providing um, educational support uh, for their students as well as resident training. We're very passionate about supporting sustainability in people, planet and animals. And we're also very um, privileged and delighted to work with Wild Love Vets International and um, by hosting um, these webinars, uh, raising awareness and as well as uh, raising funds through through global um, tracking and, and the fundraising events, so swimming and exercising and walking as, as a global team. Um, and we've raised over uh, 21,000 pounds, I believe, so far. And we will continue to, to uh, support WVI um, and come up with some other awesome ideas <laughs> to, to uh, raise further funds as well um, and, and supporting the, the projects that, that WVI is, um, are doing amazing work uh, globally. As you can see here, we also have other projects that we are involved in on the, on the bottom of the slide. And if you want to read a little bit more about that, I will put um, a link in the chat function as well. Just for everybody's information, um, uh, Nick will obviously have a, a, um, provide a lovely um, talk for us today, so we will um, answer any questions um, at the end of his talk. Um, so uh, I will now hand over to Olivia. Thank you very much. Um... Thank you very much, Will, for um, introducing VetCT. I'll just quickly introduce WVI. Um, we are an organisation that's um, very similar to VetCT. Both organisations have a huge passion for nature and um, and what and saving wildlife. Um, our values are very similar, and we in, really enjoy working in partnership. And through that partnership, to transfer the knowledge from the experts who might not be sitting on the coal face, um, but um, have the ability to, to learn, have that in-depth knowledge and um, read all the journals and do the researches. And But the people who need that knowledge are those on the conservation front line. And that's very much the essence of what both WVI and VETCT does. We're extremely lucky to have Nick Masters as our one of our veterinary advisors, as he's spent his career doing exactly this and passing his knowledge that he's learnt on to um, many practitioners in, in the field. Um, Nick has been doing both, um, doing quite a lot of work with us for delivering his expertise through courses like the Interventions in Wild Animal Health course um, in India. And we went earlier this year to a Save Vultures conference in Nepal, who, um, an area which he has worked in for quite a lot and I'm sure he will talk about in his talk. Um, Nick is currently the Director of Wildlife Health in Toronto Zoo and he's helping them to develop their wildlife health services both within, within the zoo and to the wider conservation goals of the organisation. And the fact that they're allowing him to be um, veteran, continue his role as veterinary advisor for WVI is just a great testament to how the conservation community really thrives on partnership and we really enjoy sharing our knowledge to everyone. So we're very grateful to VetCT for enabling us to give this series of webinars and um, and here is Nick. Thank you very much Nick for joining us all the way from Toronto. Very welcome 
Hopefully you can hear me okay now. I've remembered to unmute myself. And uh, what do I have to do next? Got to share this screen, see if I can get that right as well. Let's see. So I think everybody is now viewing my slideshow. Somebody please shout if I'm not. Um, and yes, thank you very much to Vetsy Teach for this opportunity. And thank you to Olivia and WVI as well for allowing me to do some of this work and then tell you about it. So I think I've got about 20 minutes and I'm going to talk about One Health. Um, as Olivia wrote, uh, it means different things to different people. And um, to me, it, it means that we recognise there is this uh, fundamental link between the health of people and the health of our, our livestock, animals that we depend on in one way or another, um, but also the health of wild animals and the environments that they live in. So uh, these kind of intricate and intimate links uh, are so important. And if you do something that messes up the health of one of those groups or part of that net, you inevitably have effects elsewhere. Um, and what we're learning more and more is that biodiversity is very protective. So as you lose it, the disease threats to people in particular become very apparent. And these, they're really big and really complex problems. And the only way you can solve them is through this kind of multidisciplinary action. So having vets as part of these, uh, these teams along with social scientists and doctors and epidemiologists, for example, is really important. And that's exactly what WVR is trying to do. Now is my, okay. so without wanting to steal my own thunder, this is essentially what I'm going to talk about. Um, the fact that public health is inextricably linked to biodiversity conservation and that as we lose species, we're going to see spillover of diseases from wild animals into people more and more. But that we mustn't think of it in terms of, well, that's the animal's problem. Um, it, it's because of what we're doing. It's, it's our behavior and the way that we're changing the ecology of our planet that is creating these disease risks and we know actually that there are there are hundreds of thousands of wild animal viruses alone capable of spilling over like this and some of them will have or we know have much higher case fatality rates than covid so this is really important stuff and i'm going to talk about bats more but for a variety of reasons they're an especially important group um, and the good news is that there are loads of actions we can take to reduce these health risks. But for me, it focuses around conserving biodiversity. It's not a nice to have, it's a kind of existential requirement now. So we protect ecosystem services that are provided to us by nature, and we're gonna reduce the threat of future pandemics. So when I was younger, a long time ago, um, after school and then as a veterinary undergraduate, I got to travel quite a bit and I went to some really biodiverse places. Uh, so the top left is Rwanda, just before big civil war, and I got to see there with a with a friend just how populated that country is. Every kind of inch of it terraced for agriculture, and actually not a lot of space for wildlife. And then just over the border, the top right, in what was Zaire, we had the opportunity to see gorilla very close up like this. I mean, it's sort of fairly low level ecotourism back then, and I think I was shocked even then by how close we could get without really considering disease transmission. Nobody asked me if I had a cold or not. And then the bottom left is in Belize. And uh, I think I saw there for the first time or realized how easy it is for parasites from wild animals to infect livestock, animals that they've not co-evolved in and cause significant disease in a way that they don't in their original wild hosts. And then the bottom right is in the Peruvian Amazon well, I spent some time on a conservation project and, you know, people there are just trying to survive really, but they're doing things like catching red tailed catfish, you can see here, but they're also hunting and catching primates and big rodents like agouti. So I think really early on, I started to have this appreciation of just how closely we're living to wild animals now, increasingly so, and opening up this interface, which is a big problem. And then I was lucky enough to do this MSc in Wild Animal Health at the Zoological Society of London and the Royal Vet College. And I really like this photo because not only because I've got hair still, but because um, many of these people, uh, my colleagues on the course are now dotted around the world doing stuff like we're trying to describe, you know, useful um, multidisciplinary project work to try and solve some of these problems. So much of what we do in zoos in terms of clinical work, um, we've learned from our domestic animal veterinary colleagues and 
preventive medicine for young cheetah like this one, and really similar to what we do in domestic cats, we can transfer a lot of that knowledge. Um, and then we can get you know more technical about it. And if we've got good teams of trained and expert staff and good facilities, um, we're confident enough to do it in big cats like this tiger and to do it on public display. So this is our Wildlife Health Centre at Toronto Zoo, which is pretty amazing, I have to say. Um, and then you can transfer all of this stuff to the wild. So um, you'll see the guy there in the background with the glasses on looking stern is John Lewis, one of the uh, original founders of WVI. Um, and this is in the Russian Far East, where I'm pretty sure they meant to catch an Amur or Siberian tiger. But um, you're working with animals, you never quite know what's going to happen. So one of these humane traps caught an Asiatic black bear instead. And rather than just let it go, this is still a great opportunity to look at the kind of infectious diseases that are circulating in St. Patrick's species to give you an idea of, you know, the burden of infection, what's, what's present, what kind of things are, are moving around in the environment and might be a risk to wildlife, livestock and to people. And I thought I'd take a moment just to consider what we mean by biodiversity. It's, it's kind of mind-bogglingly diverse. Uh, I think there's near 7,000 mammal species described now, actually. About a third of them are rodents, which is important. And over 1,400 are bats. That's really important. And there's actually about 200 species of primate as well. So those three groups are particularly important when we're talking about zoonotic disease for one reason or another. And I'm going to talk more about bats. And you can see that there are lots of species of birds and reptiles and amphibians. I think there's over 40,000 species of fish described now, if I'm right. And then there are millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of species of insects, bacteria and viruses, respectively. Um, and I've not even mentioned fungi or plants. And it's now flora, fauna and funga, as I understand it. Um, and, you know, my daughter who's about to study natural sciences at university talks about whole taxonomic groups that I was never even aware of. I don't think we were aware of when I was studying that stuff. So it's an extraordinary web of life. And so I tried to mention earlier, when you, when you tear a hole in it somewhere, you have big effects elsewhere. As Olivia pointed out, I can't give a presentation these days without talking a bit about vultures. Um, I feel completely justified doing it here because um, it's the most amazing One Health example that I have. And I think that anybody has probably. So if you don't know the story, as briefly as I can, um, back in the 80s, there were over 40 million vultures ranging across South Asia. Most of them Gyps bengalensis or white rumped vulture. So it seems like this were commonplace. And then over the next decade and two or two, um, they suffered this precipitous 99.9% .9 reduction in their numbers to just a few thousand to the extent that they were going extinct. And all of that happens through inadvertent intoxication. So vets and paravets across the Indian subcontinent were using a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug called diclofenac. You might know it as Voltrol. Um, it was licensed as a veterinary drug. It was been given to geriatric cattle for arthritic concerns mostly. And then some of those would die. They'd still have heavy residues of the drug. We didn't know it was toxic to vultures and other scavenging birds. And they would die in their hundreds having consumed some of these carcasses. And it took a while to work out what on earth was going on. It's actually been an amazing conservation success. And the reason it's been a success, we're, we're releasing, we've released the last lot of birds in Nepal now. And we've got approaching a thousand birds in conservation breeding centers in India ready for release. So the reason it's been a success is because of this multidisciplinary approach with toxicologists working out what was going on and what you needed in the environment to be safe. Um, social scientists advocating for vultures, et cetera, et cetera. And, and vets playing a key, a key but small role in all of that. So the point I'm trying to get across is that we are damaging our biodiversity enormously. And um, for a couple of decades now, we've been talking about this evolutionary period as the Anthropocene, um, you know, a period dominated by human beings. And we've come up with this term of deformation to explain this loss of species or to describe this loss of species. So there's an extinction event going on. Um, we think it's the sixth in the history of the planet but it's unusual in that it's caused by a species and that's us. And it's deeply ironic as well, because we know we're doing it, but we don't seem to be able to stop ourselves. And um, the consequences of it are so big because as you remove ecosystem services, you have this profound effect. So the top right of um, the picture there, there's a bit on carrying removal. And this is what's happened in the Asian subcontinent. So you, you reduce 
this vulture population enormously and suddenly you stop picking up uh, or they stop disposing of all of this fallen meat. And they were responsible for clearing up tens of millions of tonnes of fallen carcasses every year. So you can imagine the impact that has. And if you don't believe me about the numbers, then you should take a look at the Living Planet Index. And this one's from way back in nearly a decade ago, 2014, but it's 2022 now, it's up to date. And it's not quite the same as saying we've lost this proportion of biomass from the planet, but it, it more or less is. Scientists are monitoring thousands of species and looking at their relative abundance loss. And effectively, in my, time, my lifetime, just over half a century, we've lost about two thirds. It's, it's looking like 69% on average of all vertebrate species abundance across the planet. So it's truly incredible uh, what we're doing. And there are consequences to that, of course. So when we go back to the vulture example, um, you know, some of them are cultural and sensitive and they don't affect all of us. But if you're part of the Parsi community, then your sky burials in the towers of silence in Mumbai don't work anymore because there are no vultures or other scavenging birds to remove bodies. So this is a problem. Um, there are massive economic impacts. So there was a really healthy hide and bone trade in India where um, fallen cattle would have their hides removed uh, for selling. The vultures would then clean up those carcasses incredibly well, and then there was bones to be collected for a bone trade. As a result, carcasses, as no vultures, carcasses look like the one in the picture here, and all of that trade is lost. And then there are these really profound environmental and public health um, implications as well. So you know, water sources get contaminated by carcasses like that. And a friend just last night serendipitously sent me uh, an article which I should have picked up on, published earlier this year, um, so not included in the talk, sorry, but where people have done some statistics to show that in areas of India where uh, they were affected by the loss of vultures, there was a 4% increase in human mortality rates, equating to the deaths of half a million people across India, you know, indirectly, but pretty pretty robustly related to the loss of vultures. The other thing that happened that people always talk about is that stray dog population exploded because they replaced the vultures in scavenging these carcasses, but they do a really poor job of it by comparison. And um, so they look more like that at the end of it rather than the way vultures leave them. Um, and the rabies figures themselves are really hard to get to the bottom of, but post-exposure prophylaxis went through the roof as more people got bitten. And uh, I think we're in the billions of US dollars extra cost to the Indian economy. So the thing I want to say at this point, it's a really key message from the talk, is that um, it's, it's hard to quantify this, but the best analogy I've heard is that um, if you think of the microbial population of our gut, if we have a really healthy microflora, um, that goes a long way to excluding pathogens, whether it's bacteria like salmonella or nasty nematodes or whatever. Um, and if you strip that out through overuse of antibiotics or parasiticides, you create a good environment for the emergence of these pathogens. And that's the way of thinking of it for me about our ecosystems. We're tearing these big holes in it and we're allowing the emergence of pathogens in the environment. So without going into too much detail, um, it's becoming apparent that more and more zoonotic disease is occurring in frequency and intensity. Um, so here are some of the big cases from the, uh, since the 80s. And Hendra and Nipah are both paramyxoviruses, and bats are the primary reservoirs for those in Australasia, Southeast Asia. You'll remember SARS, most of you, I'm sure, from the early 2000s. And SARS, MERS, and COVID are all beta coronaviruses, these RNA viruses that can mutate very rapidly. And we, we know from SARS that um, had a low case fatality rate, thank goodness, but it, it traveled very quickly along international flight lines. And so we can see how that's important. Um, MERS, a much higher case fatality rate, I think it was about 35%. So you can see how some of these coronaviruses could be really damaging to us. Um, I'm going I'm to mention Ebola in a bit more detail. So Ebola was first recognised in the 1970s, and um, little outbreaks of it have been occurring ever since. But in 2014, this enormous one took off in Guinea, and it spread to Sierra Leone and Liberia and ran for uh, over two years. And in that time, it had these big impacts, like I've been talking about with the vultures. So uh, I think over 11,000 people died. Over 17,000 children were orphaned as a result of that. 
um, and a whole kind of generation of school kids lost their education for two years. 500 healthcare workers died, and as a result, um, TB, HIV, malaria all surged because they weren't being treated in the same way. Uh, it cost the local economies about two billion US dollars, and the Western world gave about three billion US dollars in aid to try and help with this. So the consequences are absolutely enormous. I'm going to talk more about COVID in the next slide, but I wanted to mention here bird flu. So highly pathogenic avian influenza and these particular subtypes, H5N1, have been circulating in Asia for a long time, but never going further, really, sometimes coming to the West with migration. But in 2020, there was this reassortment um, somewhere in Europe. And now, as you'll probably know, it's really taken off and it's it's a huge pandemic. And I think we don't have a handle on the actual numbers of free living wild birds that have died as well, but it's a massive increase in the number of species and the number of birds per species. So I think the figures of poultry, cold commercial poultry and wild birds that have died outstrip the numbers for COVID enormously. So this is this is huge, this is here to stay. And if there was reassortment, you know, starting to see this in mammals, if there was reassortment that meant it would infect people, that would be a real problem, routine, that would be a real problem because from the few cases we've had, we know this has a 60% a mortality rate, fatality rate. So a little bit on COVID without teaching you to suck eggs. Um, viruses aren't strictly alive. They need this host to replicate or a host to replicate. Um, there are hundreds of coronaviruses alone across many taxonomic groups, and they've co-evolved over the years. So we have several that cause common colds in us, um, little to no symptoms. Um, but those three we've just mentioned, SARS, MERS, and SARS-CoV-2, are examples of those that have spilt over from a species, a wildlife species that they're co-evolved in. And when they land in another species, they cause major illness. So I'm not sure about this 80% asymptomatic figure early on in COVID, but um, that certainly seemed to go up. And then as it's become a human virus, because that's what it is now, it's, it's co-evolving, has co-evolved considerably already, um, symptoms or its virulence decrease again. And um, we've done a lot of experimental infection of animals for human treatment of vaccination trials, but we know that naturally canids, lots of feds, including big cats like that tiger I showed you earlier, can be infected now and get sick from COVID. There's a problem for mustelids in particular, um, mink. You might have seen examples of that in um, mink farms in Holland and in Denmark, but also in monkeys and the great apes. And we have this weird situation in North America where white-tailed deer are infected seemingly from several separate events. And now there's transmission from deer to deer. So it seems like we've set up uh, from people, this presumably come from hunters and others, and we've set up a, a new reservoir. So I wanted to touch on bats. Um, there's a lot of species, and of course, if you've got you know, a fixed number of co-evolved co viruses per species, then that means there's a lot of co-evolved viruses in bats because there's so many species. We used to have this hypothesis that um, because as a mammal, the only flying mammal has such a high metabolic rate, um, when they got to these very high temperatures, they created a kind of fever and they were resistant to infection in a way that other mammals are not. But that seems to be an oversimplification. And what we think now is that bats have this very unique immunotolerance. Um, they have good innate immune response. They're good at phagocytosing cells that are infected with viruses, but they also don't have these over exuberant, um, aberrant immune responses like we see in COVID with people that got really sick. They're good at being infected at low levels and not overdoing it in terms of their immune response. I needed to touch on wet markets, I think, because so much was talked about them uh, as a source, a possible source of COVID and other infections. And it's culturally sensitive, but I'm talking about markets that process live wild animals. And what we're doing with those is we are creating these risk factors for animals. We're catching up animals from the wild. We're, we're bringing them together and mixing them in ways they would never be mixed in the wild. And um, we're, we're getting them to those places by transporting them in close confinement. We cause lots of stress um, and immunocompromise. And then not surprisingly, they're shedding pathogens and they're susceptible to infection and disease. And we're also creating risks for people because we're bringing ourselves into close contact with these animals. And for those people that are actually killing them and, and then uh, butchering them, 
intimate contact with body fluids of these animals. Uh, so as a result, we're exposing ourselves and animals, both livestock and wild animals, to all sorts of new pathogens. And we're creating ideal conditions for mutation of viruses and ad adaptation to new hosts. So it's not surprising we see the emergence of zoonoses. And I think it's worth mentioning as well that amongst the viruses, it's RNA viruses that are particularly high risk because they can mutate so rapidly, as we've seen with SARS-CoV-2. So uh, amongst all that doom and gloom, um, what can we do about it all? Uh, well, um, the first thing I think is that uh, we need to stop moving everything around so much um, ourselves and just stuff, food items, whatever it is. These global supply chains are a way, as we saw with COVID, of uh, transmitting new pathogens really quickly if we're not careful. Um, it's culturally sensitive, as I said, but I think there's a very strong argument to ban the sale for consumption of high-risk animals, so particularly from those groups that we know zoonotic infections come from most regularly. And we need to try and reduce these bridging host opportunities. So it's, it's been somewhat disproven now, but there, there was this early thought that SARS-CoV-2 came from horseshoe bats. It somehow passaged through pangolin, um, and, and that that change in the spike protein somehow, I think, uh, gave it the opportunity to infect people in a way it wouldn't have done directly from bats. Somewhat disproven, but um, this is still a really important thing. So places like wet markets create the environments for that to happen and we need to minimise them. And then there's other things we can do to reduce conditions to, uh, or conditions that predispose to this kind of spillover. And then longer term, we really need to think about that because COVID showed us how good we are at you know, being reactive and doing amazing things like generating vaccines in months rather than 10 years as we used to. But actually, we need to be planning much better for the future. So I think there's a, a new research paradigm here needed, uh, and it hin hinges on that multidisciplinary thing that Olivia and I have been talking about since the start. We need social scientists working with, with vets, with epidemiologists, um, with people that know how to develop vaccines, all this kind of stuff, um, and ideally in the same building. So new centres that bring together the idea of biodiversity and public health being inextricably linked. And then to bring it back to what WVI is trying really hard to do and um, making sure that we train the right people appropriately to help with these big and really complicated projects. So I'm nearly there. Um, my take home messages are that um, if you were a disease ecologist, you were not surprised at all by COVID happening. Um, I worked with Andrew Cunningham at ZSL who had been researching viruses and bats for two decades and basically saying something bad was going to happen. Um, so COVID-19 should not be a surprise. Um, we know increasingly that as we lose biodiversity, we're driving the emergence of these diseases. We know that RNA viruses are particularly important, especially from bats, but also rodents and primates. Um, and we know that our current behaviour is facilitating spillover. We need to do something about that. Um, and I think we can't just bury heads in the sand. We're definitely going to see the emergence of more zoonotic disease and more pandemics. So on that slightly gloomy note, um, uh, a kind of positive thing to end on, I want to say thank you again to, uh, to VETCT for the opportunity, to WVI, um, and then these institutions across the top of this slide and, and many others and individuals who have sort of helped me in my career to get involved with some of this stuff. And just to finish finally, this is a photo from the course that Olivia mentioned, Interventions in Wild Animal Health, um, where we're training veterinarians in biodiverse countries with high risk of the emergence of zoonotic disease to know how to um, respond to those things and play their part in these multidisciplinary projects. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, uh, Nick. That was really informative. And um, thank you for all the work that everybody has been doing on this, on this subject, as well as clearly there's a lot to do still and on the projects to come. So thank you very, very much.